Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome back. Okay, thank you for joining back. Um, we will uh, start this session with uh, chapter 13. Shani, you have a question? I see you raised your hand. Yeah, I just trying to make sure I'm understanding in terms of, so a word of nod is something that you may know um, so something the person does not know, but somebody else knows. Is that kind of how the word of knowledge is? Like you were saying in terms of Pastor Nancy was giving an example about the red car, but you knew, but yeah. um, she didn't actually know. Then prophecy is something in the future? Yes. Okay. So how about when, because I've been to a church when the pastor was a prophet and he was saying stuff about people like, I see you crying to the Lord and crying out to the Lord about certain situations. What about that? Is that like a word of knowledge? That's not really prophecies. He's saying like, I see you crying about something. And the person was like, oh yeah, like you know, how you know this? Like that's a word of knowledge then? Correct, yes, because uh, they know that, right? The individual knows that they were crying out to God, right? So it, so word of knowledge has uh, two individuals where one individual knows about it, what has happened or what is happening. Okay, thank you. So somebody can have the gift of, I guess, the word of knowledge and also be a, have a gift of prophecy, can have both? Yes. Okay, so, okay, perfect. Element of both, but, uh, you know, so all, it's like, uh, for example, in context of worship, um, all prophetic worship, uh, sorry, what, how do I say this? <laughs> uh, mm. All spontaneous songs, all spontaneous songs are not prophetic in nature, right? For example, um, or um, no, I can I can pick up a guitar. Uh, so for example, if someone I've passed Ashish asks me to lead worship on the spot, uh, I can take my guitar and start leading um, on the spot. That means I'm leading worship spontaneously. But I can lead a, uh, you know, sing a song that is familiar to everyone, that's familiar to me. Like here I am to worship. Here I am to power. Up. What am I doing? I'm singing spontaneously, or I can spontaneously, um, you know, yeah, basically sing. But the prophetic is different. Is where I'm singing, leaning into. I'm declaring what God wants me to declare. Um, so that's basically uh, it has an element of both with, with with regards to word of knowledge and the prophetic, but one is more distinct <clears throat> than the other. Sorry, just going to put my phone in silent. Uh, that, um, am I making sense, uh, Shani? Yes, but, yes. I mean, you understood it. Yeah. So that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Just one small question. Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, sometimes you pray for anyone who is uh, undergoing any physical challenge or a sickness. Now it's in our heart's desire that he or she gets uh, healed. And it is also the will of God that it is to be healed. But how do you stop uh, telling them in a sense like, you know, do not worry, you will be healed. Or what's the right way to put it across? We will continue to pray and seek God or don't worry, you will be healed. Because uh, they are looking up to me, example, when you're praying, they look up to us yes. and they know that it's God who heals. Yes. So how do you slowly distinguish and... You know, we, we continue to stay on the truth, Akil. Uh, we do not deviate from the truth. The fundamental truth <clears throat> uh, is we keep emphasizing, uh, reassuring what the Bible says, who God is, what the Bible says. That's all I would do. Um, yeah, uh, you know, we'll continue to contend for this. We we will not have the answer. It, I think it's very safe to say that I don't know, uh, you know, why this is happening, uh, what not. I say, I don't know, but what I know is we can pray for, you know, continue to pray for a healing or a deliverance, a miracle, because this is what the word says. Uh, Jesus hasn't changed. The same Jesus who healed, you know, who did all of this in his day, is the same Jesus that I worship and I serve, and He's alive. And the Bible says, "By His stripes we are healed." He carried our sorrows. He carried our griefs. What we are, what are we doing? Is we are using the Word, right? And uh, Hebrews chapter four, I think, yeah, yeah, it says, 
his word is like a sword, double-edged sword, uh, you know, sharper than a double-edged sword that can pierce through the spirit and soul. They, it can differentiate. So it can minister to us. It can minister to us is what. So I will not deviate from the truth. No matter how many times I have to say it, that's what I will say it because it's the truth. It's constant. It doesn't change. Are you with me? Yeah, because that's what the Bible says. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I have this conversation uh, with my son, uh, you know, um, at this. So we are content and believing for a miracle for my dad. Uh, my dad is in an advanced stage of cancer at the moment. And, uh, you know, I was taking this three days of emergency leave. Uh, and I didn't want to miss today because I had to finish the portions. <laughs> um, you know, he is right now undergoing radiation therapy and whatnot. Right? But, the, you know, every night uh, when I put my son to bed, he asks, is like, okay, when is Jesus going to heal, uh, you know, granddad? <laughs> uh, when is he going to heal? Uh, when, when is he going to heal? Um, how, the, the hardest thing to answer is a child's question. <laughs> you know, because they're so innocent and they know completely, uh, you know, when you, they take, uh, yeah, they take they take God at his word more than anybody else, more than any other adult. When we see Jesus heals, it's like, okay, when is he going to heal? Why hasn't he healed? Um, huh, I mean, it's, you know, it's like, oh, stop asking such hard questions. Like, even my students in college don't ask me hard questions like this. But, uh, but the, our faith is, I wouldn't say tested, but it it reminds us, it rekindles our faith. It it should those questions like that from my son. It makes my faith strong, and to remember, remind myself of who God is, what his word says. Because as human beings, we constantly think to forget. Right? It's like, um, but it's very important that we remind ourselves, okay, by his stripes, we are healed. You know, that's the truth. Um, you know, sometimes he might choose to give me an explanation, but he doesn't owe me an explanation. I work for him. He is my boss. I don't work, you know, he doesn't work for me. Right, and so just being in the posture of uh, of knowing your place and knowing who he is. Yes, he is our father, you know, and and you know he is he is holy, he is our healer. Um, but we do what we have to do. We believe in the truth. That is the word of God. That is our hope. Right, our hope is not wishful thinking. Right, it's not say I, I hope he heals. Yeah, that's not wishful, right? I hope it rains today. I hope it doesn't rain today. I hope India wins this match. I hope, you know, etc., etc. That is wishful thinking. That is hope according to the world. But when we say we have hope in Jesus Christ, it's rock solid. It's more real than the chair you're sitting on. It's more real than the ground we are standing on. When we say that Jesus is going to return, we are not saying that I hope he returns. His return is imminent. Right, one hundred percent sure, guarantee he is coming back. Acts chapter one verse eleven says, "This same Jesus who went up is going to come back." That's his word, and and he does not lie. Right, we we've learned that he cannot lie. Right, it's not that he doesn't lie; he cannot lie. And if his word says that he is a healer, I'm going to take him at his word, regardless of my situation, my of my circumstances, because my situation circumstances can change. One day good, next day bad. One day good, next day bad, up and down, up and down. But he is the constant line. He is the unchanging one. And so my faith, my hope, everything is going to be dependent on his word. And that's what I'm going to use to encourage the other individual as well, to be strong, be strong, right? Um, as Christians, when we go through life, we have this we have this mysterious privilege that we can carry. We, we all learn the story of you know, Daniel and his friends and all of that, right? Um, you know, what the friend says, you know, we are not going to bow down to this idol. Uh, you can throw us into the fire. Our God is more than able to save us. But even if he doesn't, you know the story, right? Even if he doesn't, it's fine. We will not bow down to your idol. It's all very nice when we read it and it's like, wow, what a story, amazing. No chance, you know? But there are times and moments in life when we go through, we don't realize it, that we can we have this weird or a strange privilege where we can make statements like they did. Right? 
I know my God is a healer. You know, I know he, he is Jehovah Rapha. That's what, who, who he is. Right? And but even if he doesn't, doesn't change the fact that he is not the healer. You, you get what I'm saying, right? Uh, um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, there's a question from um, Lucy. It says, how do we go about in an unbeliever for their sickness simultaneously where they do their rituals also? Applying the ash on them, they asked me also to pray. It was like, let uh, any other ways, let any other, uh, any of the ways work. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Lucy, I think, you know, we need to realize that we are live in a world that is desperate, that is desperate for a breakthrough. Um, you know, they will do, they will do whatever they want to do to receive a breakthrough. They will go wherever they have to spend, how much ever they can to receive a breakthrough and whatnot. Uh, but we seize every opportunity we get to, to introduce Jesus to them. Uh, if you have that opportunity to, to declare uh, and, and speak the word of, of, of the good news of Jesus over them, um, do it. Do it with absolute conviction. Uh, and you leave the rest to the Holy Spirit. Right? Um, yeah, because he, he does his thing. Um, yeah. Okay. That's more like an opportunity, no? Because yes. if uh, you're uh, ministering to an unbeliever and thing, and it, you know, because I've personally felt it's more of a joy rather than you know, reaching out to Christians who've heard the gospel, heard everything, and know everything, yes. rather than uh, somebody who doesn't know and they have a different background and they ask you to pray for. Yes. It's more of contentment. Uh, Correct. And yeah. it's uh, if God wills, nothing like. That. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we Christians, uh, we need to realize, um, you know, I, I understand that we get scared of evangelism. I mean, in in the context of India, uh, given the political climate that we are in, um, I, I understand the fear. Uh, but just think about this with me. The good news of Jesus is the best news anyone can ever receive. Isn't it? It's the best news anyone can ever receive. It's the news of eternal life, isn't it? And we need to be excited about it. If we are going to, if we know, otherwise, you know, there's not going to be any conviction in what we are sharing. So, <laughs> okay. Yes, brother. Yes, brother. The moment I, uh, the moment I go to that house to visit her the sister comes and uh, asks for the prayer the other sister comes with the hash to apply it on her <laughs> yeah it was like that type of a situation but uh, yeah. i just make uh, made her to speak the words of god jesus uh, to speak out the words that jesus christ is my healer and something like she had a stroke last week right, right. so it, was, it happened like this yeah yeah lucy i think uh you know it's uh, it's wonderful that you have that opportunity. Um, it's incredible. Um, so you do what you you have to do. Um, we leave the rest to God. Yes, yes, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Shani. Yeah, I'm just uh, I just curious, like when your son asks you the question about your father, like what is your answer? Because <laughs> I asked God the same answer for me in terms of my conditions, like when am I gonna be here? My mom has two, I've been dealing with the medical condition since I was eight years old. And I, you know, do this, forgive people, do this. And, you know, meditate on these healing scriptures and my healing has not manifest. So what do you do for people who've been dealing with something almost their entire lives mm -hmm. and still no breakthrough? Yeah, I mean, it's, none of us want to be in a place like that, uh, isn't it, Shani? Um, it's, it's what life is. We will not have all the answers to it. I can give you an answer right now to your question, uh, but that will not satisfy you because I mean it, it's, they're going to be different challenges. But uh, um, what I would say, I mean, I am glad. <clears throat> I, I I should say then this is specifically towards me, and uh, I should say that. Um, um, 
<clears throat> I am <clears throat> sorry, Ms. Mithra. I'm glad that I, I'm in a place spiritually that over the years, um, over the last two and a half decades or so, I've had uh, wonderful men and women of God who've poured into my life, uh, who've helped me grow spiritually, in spiritual maturity as well, in understanding the word of God, studying his word, his nature, his attributes, who God is. And that's helped me to be in a place, a uh, stronger place, I would say, than I was 20 years ago. Uh, and so now, as challenges come, uh, I don't have the answer to all the challenges. You know, um, I can share a lot of it right now. Uh, I wish I had all the answers to uh, like a, a lot of questions that I have right now, but I don't. But I've learned to trust him. And you encourage the person, um, you know, you walk with the person. Uh, the only thing that's going to give us hope, the, what the, dif the difference between a person who does not have a hope and fighting for a breakthrough versus a person who's fighting for a breakthrough and has a hope is a very different thing. And again, as I mentioned, hope is not wishful hope, wishful thinking. It's our hope is in Jesus. We know how our story ends, so to speak. Um, so. My immediate answer to my son when he asked me that question, when he said, okay, when is Jesus going to heal Tata or, you know, grandfather, is uh, I said, I don't know. And he asked me, okay, why hasn't he healed him yet? I don't know, Ethan, but uh, we'll continue to pray. My son's name is Ethan, <laughs> if you're wondering. Uh, <clears throat> I said, I don't know, Ethan. Uh, and he, I think he appreciates that saying that I don't know part as well. I don't know, but we will make sure that we pray about it every day and uh, declare the truth. Um, that's what I would do, Shani. No matter how many nights it takes to receive the breakthrough, no matter how many months, how many years it takes, um, my faith is uh, uh, on a solid rock, and that is Jesus Christ. Um, and that's all. And that's all it is. And I'm going to keep praying without giving up every day because if the bible says that he he died for us he, by his stripes we are healed um, i'm not going to leave that blank check as is without using it i'm going to make sure i use that word declare that word as much as i can as often as i can yeah okay thank you so kind of just kind of um kind of stay you know stay in the word and just you know keep your um you know keep your faith when you're kind of stuck in a situation in terms of your, your healing i mean not stuck but when you kind of hope defer makes the heart sick that kind of thing you kind of just if you have people around you like a church or whatever if you don't just try to get into the word and you know stay yeah. you know by his stripes you are healed so is that what you that was you're saying yes Yes. Okay. And it is not easy. I realize that. I understand that. I experience that. It is not easy. It's you know. It's. I, I'm just not saying this. It's one thing to say it, and uh, uh, and it's you know. It's. I understand that. It's uh, as we declare that that we are going to stay in the word. It the challenge, the mountains was not going to become smaller, or whatnot. But um, he gives us the strength to endure it. Right. Um, one day at a time one day at a time as as i 40 says you know those who wait upon the lord uh, another translation says those who hope in the lord will renew their strength like eagles you know will rise on eagles wings that means one day at a time the next day he'll give you the strength the next day he'll give you the strength to face that day um and so uh, that's that's what i yeah that's the focus okay thank you yeah you're welcome Okay. Okay. You 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 speak in uh, you you ask in Hindi, no? Someone can translate it. Okay, translation. Okay, so we had a question from Joseph who uh, shared a bit. 
in Hindi. Uh, can someone please uh, translate that? Can you use the mic, please? Okay, okay. So yeah. Joseph is asking, like, uh, uh, when we receive the salvation, and uh, now we are walking in righteousness, but later on we commit a sin. So, like, uh, the uh, the salvation can go about, uh, go gifts. The gifts of the spirit and all what we receive while walking on the righteousness path, they will go. And no, I mean that's a simple answer. <laughs> so yeah, see, yeah, when we when we give our life to okay, we just kind of deviated a little bit from healing and deliverance, but okay, um, yeah. So you know, when you give your life to God, you receive salvation, right? Uh, and then your journey of righteousness begins. But you may fail, you know, uh, for whatever reason, something might happen. Um, but John chapter uh, one, John chapter one, verse eight says, uh, "If we confess our sins and repent of it, He is faithful and just to forgive." Jesus, right? It talks about um, His forgiveness. Um, so, why uh, is still stuck? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Any question. Uh, I went through a situation where I and my elder sister, I was in a, my elder sister's house and we both were there and one in the family came and uh, their guardian was in hospital in ICU. Yeah. His, their guardian, guardian. What is that? Guardian means their... Guardian, guardian. Family head. Family head, family head. Family head. head oh, person, okay, okay, person. okay. Yeah, he was in the ICU. Okay. So they came and they said that uh, what God can do, you you pray to God. So if God will heal, then we will give our life to God. So we prayed and we said that yeah, God is able to heal in any situation. And we prayed for two days and uh, after that we got news that he is no more. So we we were feeling that uh, how why it not happen. We are feeling same that we said many scriptures to them, and they were they were about to give their life to Jesus, and why it happened. So, yeah, it's one of the great mysteries, no? As in, why it didn't happen? <laughs> uh, I wish we have all the answers to it, but we we don't know. Um, we do not know. Come on, but you did your bit. I think that's that's what is necessary. That you don't give up. Um, maybe that's, I mean, that seed that you planted, God can use it to, you know, uh, bring forth fruits much later. You might you never know, God in His sovereignty can use any seed that is planted uh, for His glory. Um, but as His children, let's be obedient and do what we are called to do. That's important. Because we will not, and that's just one instance. And as we go through life, there will be numerous instances where you will not have the answers to which uh, to circumstances which you wish you had answers to um, but that's uh, yeah cool okay um, so uh, somehow 25 minutes is gone uh, answering questions which is fine thank you for asking questions um, and I think uh, uh, yeah, I like having this conversation, just sharing my experience, whatever I know, uh, with you guys. Okay, we look at chapter 13 um, very quickly. Chapter 13, um, titled, The Local Church as a Healing and Delivering Community. The Local Church as a Healing and Delivering Community. Uh, in the next semester, next year, you will have a subject called The Local Church where you will learn in depth about just the local church as a body of Christ. Uh, you know, again, its origins, its story and whatnot. It's exciting. But we'll just look at a little glance of it. In this chapter, um, God's heart is to dwell among his people. Okay, You can highlight it or you can write it down in your notebook if you are writing it. Um, God's heart, he desires to dwell among his people people okay from genesis to revelation there is this one recurring thing it's repeated in different ways from genesis to revelation you will see this theme that is god saying i will be your god 
you will be my people i will be your god you will be my people you will be my people i will be your god i will be your god you will be my people it's and that you you will see that theme reflecting in all the 66 books of the bible even in revelation uh, towards the end of revelation you see that i will be your god you will be my people god's desire this burning desire is that he will dwell among his people dwell means and another word for dwell uh, in the hebrew is tabernacle right he will tabernacle among us. that's just the other word so in genesis in john chapter 1 um, if you we know the uh, chapter very well right in the beginning was the word the word was with god and the word was god and we come down to verse 14 what does it say he became flesh and dwelt among us in other words he became flesh and tabernacled among us that he jesus came he's the manifest son of god he dwelt among his people are, are, are you with me right and so in this chapter what we're going to look at is the importance as a community to host his presence everybody say host his presence Okay, thank you. So hosting is what you're taking care. You're you know you're preparing. If a guest is coming to your house, you are the host, right? You are going to cook food, or swiggy, okay, or <laughs> whichever is fine. It's the choice is yours. But you are the host, right? You want to take make sure that the guest is feeling welcomed, and the guest feels comfortable, isn't it? So that's what a hosting is. Um, so, but in the Bible context, right? Now we know we learned a little bit about it in praise and worship class last semester. Um, from the fall, when did when did the fall happen? Genesis chapter three-ish, right? Middle when. Um, so before that, Adam and Eve was in the garden, and they had they would God would walk in the cool of the garden. They would speak with them, right? There was this relationship that was there. Or what happened? Sin came. Sin came and separated them from God, isn't it? So from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Exodus chapter 25, Genesis chapter 3 to Exodus chapter 25, how many years gap? 2,500 years. For 2,500 years, there was no dwelling place for God on earth like it was before the fall. Right now, again, between Genesis three and Exodus twenty-five, you would see that there was visitations of God. God visited Noah. Right? God visited Abraham. His hand was on him. Right? Uh, he would speak to Joseph in dreams, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? There were visitations of God, but there was no resting place for him. Right? There was no a place of habitation since the fall. And then Moses comes into the picture, and then God tells Moses to build him a sanctuary where there. He, in the middle of the cherubim, he will meet with people. I'm just going to take us through a quick history lesson, very quick history lesson in five minutes. Are you, are you paying attention? Yes, this is what happened in the book of Exodus, right? Now, after Exodus, what happens? What comes after Exodus? Thank you, <laughs> Leviticus <laughs> and Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, in many cases, is uh, like a re. Um, capturing the events of Exodus and Leviticus, right? Okay, and then comes the book of Joshua. You're welcome. Okay, so <laughs> right. So what happens is now in the book of Joshua, the people of Israel have entered the promised land, right? God has commanded them to go and chase the enemy away, all the Canaanites, or you know, all the ites, um, those who are work uh, worshiping all these Id uh, idols and whatnot. God is saying, don't mingle with them, don't uh, don't compromise with your way of life, right? Because I've called you to be set apart, right? But what the people of Israel do, they don't chase their enemies away, they compromise, right? Uh, they begin to worship the, their idols, the, you know, the, the Canaanites' idols and whatnot. So that's the book of Joshua. Now suddenly, the book of Joshua, you don't read about the tabernacle anymore. 
the thing that they had through the wilderness suddenly has disappeared. And then you go into the book of Joshua. They've gone back to the uh, to the method of worshipping through altars. What used to happen in Genesis. Again, there is no news of the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. The thing that was with them through the 40 years in the wilderness that led them, right? There's no news. There's no place of there's no news of this common place where God met with them. The tabernacle, the meeting place, the dwelling place. It was a common place where divinity met with humanity. It was not there. But when you come to First Samuel, you will you know there's a mention of the Ark of the Covenant and where it is placed. It says the Ark of the Covenant was in a place called Shiloh. That's all we know. So from Exodus, we've come to Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, there's no news. Judges, gone, forgotten. Right? Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it says, there grew a generation that did not know who this God is and what, the, what he had done for the people of Israel. That means that it came a time where a generation grew up, they had no clue of what this God had done. Nothing. That's how much they had erased. They had no idea of the tabernacle of Moses, no ark of the covenant, nothing. And then fast forward to First Samuel, uh, we know that this ark was in the place called Shiloh. That's it. And then uh, uh, you know the Philistines attack Israel. I'm going through a history lesson, guys. I want you to pay attention. Okay, this is a lot. In First Samuel chapter four, Philistines attack Israelites, and then Phil Israelites get killed. Thirty thousand people are killed. Thirty thousand Israel soldiers, men, are killed by Philistines. Right, uh, first chapter, first Samuel chapter four. Um, the Eli is the high priest then, and he had two sons, very evil sons. They were priests, but they slept with women who came to the, you know, to the temple. They did every evil thing in the eyes of the Lord, and they they were like, okay, Philistines are attacking us. You you know what? In the history book, it says if we took the Ark of the Covenant and went ahead, God will give us the victory. So they thought. Victory was a formula to take the Ark of the Covenant without any relationship. Are you following? Now they lost big time. Thirty thousand people died. Uh, you know, both Eli's sons die. Eli falls off the chair and he breaks his neck and he dies. The Ark of the Covenant is now captured by the Philistines. Okay. And then fast forward to First Samuel chapter sixteen. David is anointed as king. Forget Saul. Okay, <laughs> you know, uh, Saul was the first king of Israel. He not even uh, during his time the Ark of the Covenant was not there. It was still captured. It was not in Jerusalem, but he did not bother. But David comes into the scene, and then fast forward to Second Samuel chapter six. The first thing that David does when he is anointed as a king of Israel and Judah in Second Samuel chapter six, it says David took. 30,000 men went and brought the ark back to Jerusalem. Now, somewhere David again must have gone to the history books and said, okay, on the day the ark was captured, 30,000 men were killed. I'm going to take the same number of men and go get the ark back to Jerusalem. Are you following? Now, the time gap between 1 Samuel chapter 4 and 2 Samuel chapter 6 is about 70 odd years. Now, for 2,500 years, from Genesis 3 to Exodus 25, nobody felt like pursuing the presence. And then from Joshua to 2 Samuel 6, until you know David, 70 odd years, nobody felt to pursue the presence of God. They had forgotten that it was God's desire to dwell among his people. It took a worshipper, a radical worshipper to realize that. That, okay, hey, God desires to dwell with us. And so I desire for him to dwell with us. Are you with me? So you, we cannot host his presence if there is no pursuit. I'll say that one more time. We cannot host his presence if there is no pursuit of his presence. We pursue his presence to host his presence. Are you following? We pursue him for us, for us to host him eventually okay so what happens when we host him as a community 
in uh, Psalm 132, verse 13 to 18, uh, it says, For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place. Now, in the new covenant, Zion is the, the, is the spiritual name for the church. Okay, we are the church. That means we are Zion. We are God's people. That's what Zion means, God's chosen people in the new covenant. Understood? So when the scripture says, For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Okay, now pay attention from verse 15. It says, I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare the lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. Okay. Um, so, God chooses where he wishes to dwell. He's made it very clear that I want to dwell among you guys. You are my people. I want to be your God. Okay. Verse 15 onwards, what does it say? I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. So what happens as a result? When we host his presence, there will be supernatural provision, supernatural prosperity, supernatural blessing, as mentioned in verse 15. And verse 16 says, I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. So when we host his presence, there is salvation what's the greek word for salvation so so it's it's not just salvation as being saved it's a word loaded with all the goodness of the kingdom of god right from healing deliverance wholeness etc right um so there is forgiveness healing deliverance victory wholeness total well-being and the joy of salvation that resounds continually among us um there i will make the horn of david grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. Now, verse 17 says, I will make the horn of David grow. What does that mean? <laughs> right? What does the horn of David mean? That David had a horn or something. The horn was symbolic of strength. Horn was a symbolic of Strength. Now, if you look at all the altars in the tabernacle of Moses, every four corners had a horn. Okay, now if you look at the cross references for just all the scriptures that has horn mentioned, you'll be amazed. Okay, so horn is a, uh, is a symbol of strength. Okay, so when verse 17 says, There I will make the horn of David grow, it simply means that there will be continual increase in strength and dominion and then it says i will prepare a lamp for my anointed i will prepare a lamp for my anointed what does lamp do brings light that causes revelation so god is saying okay when i am hosted when i'm with you when i dwell among you there will be constant revelation of who i am and of everything around you okay are you all with me, guys? Okay, so uh, Psalm 132 is wonderful. You should read it. Um, and then to go on, when the king is enthroned, his kingdom manifests. Psalm 22, verse 3. But you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. You are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. Now, again, in the praise and worship class, we learn something. Um, if God is enthroned, Someone else is dethroned. Okay, if God is enthroned, the devil is dethroned. Okay, so how is he enthroned? God is enthroned on the praises of our you know, of his people. Right? Psalm 100 says, uh, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. So again, if you are entering God's praise, God's gates with praise and thanksgiving. Whose gates are we entering when we complain, whine, grumble, and mumble? The devil's. Thank you very much. Okay. So when the king is enthroned, his kingdom manifests. Okay. Is 
seen. Okay. When we are gathered together, his power ought to be there. Uh, in First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, it says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we are, right now, we are gathered together in the name of Jesus, isn't it? Yes? Um, so our gatherings need to look like the gatherings, you know, like how it was when Jesus was there. Okay? Um, there has to be a demonstration of his power, of his presence. Right? It should not be focused on the glitter of the stage and the light uh, and whatnot. If the focus is shifted from Jesus to just celebrate uh, and, and make your pastor a celebrity or a super pastor, or whatever it is, the focus is shifted, right? If the focus is on the equipments, if, it's, if the focus is on the grandeur of how we can do things, how, how we can make a better PPT, and if the focus is all only on that but not on Jesus, we are missing the point. You guys with me? Okay. Um, right. I think I'll uh, pause here because too much information. Uh, just finish, go through this chapter. It's very simple. Um, you know, the pursuit of his presence and hosting his presence is the most wonderful thing, a journey that any one of us can be on as individuals and also as a collective. The pursuit of his presence and learning to host his presence is the most wonderful journey anyone can be on. There is a huge price to pay, but on the other hand, you are getting God. So it, the price is fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, so that's about it for this course. And uh, I hope you there's something that you could learn from it. Um, for ministering, healing, and deliverance. I will share the uh, your assignment in the stream section. Uh, it's, it will be a simple assignment. See, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm very good like that. I give only one assignment, final, OK, unlike the rest. So <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, Shani. Yeah. So how many classes um, can you miss before you just automatically fill the class, no matter what grades you get? I I I don't know the math behind that, Shani. Yeah. Okay. I I don't know the math behind that, but why? How many class did you miss? I missed two, but I was sick too. It's okay. Fifteen okay. percent. Sorry, what? Fifteen percent. You have to have attendance eighty-five percent. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, let me stop the recording for a minute and just hang on online, okay? You, um, so officially, this is the last lecture. Thank you all for joining. I'm going to stop the recording.